Coming up on Digital Music Trends 219, recorded on the 11th of February 2015, we discuss the recommendations made by the US Copyright Office on the future of music copyright, the Grammys and the Creators Alliance, Deezer Elite expanding, Rhapsody's 2.5 million subscribers, Apple the label, the Billboard Power List and the Silicon Flat Irons Conference on innovation in the creation and distribution of content. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Lianelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available in a wide range of services and many of which enable you to subscribe to the show uh, and if you'd like to receive a, an actual mail out that lets you know when the show comes out, uh, I send it just a couple of hours after the show's out uh, you know, and what we talk about each week really, uh, you can sign up right from the homepage on digitalmusictrends.com or you can go to the shortened link on bit.ly slash DMT list. And this week, it's a real pleasure to welcome back to the show Cristela Garcia, and now Associate, associate Professor of uh, Law at uh, Colorado Law. So hi, Cristela, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Good morning. I'm very well. How are you? It's great to have you. Yeah, very, very well. Thanks. And it's also... Yeah. It's also great to have Dan Kaplowitz, uh, the founder of Friendly Fire Recordings. Uh, uh, he's in San Francisco. How's it going, Dan? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me back on the show. It's great to have you and uh, lots to talk about today. And we're going on one morning with the audience. We're going to start by talking about copyright, but don't despair. It will be over in no time. And then we'll be talking about Grammys, <laughs> Apple, Rhapsody and all sorts of other fun stuff. And so uh, this week, uh, the copyright, uh, last week, actually, the Copyright Office re released a 245 page document entitled Copyright and the Music Marketplace, outlining its recommendations for the future of music copyright. Uh, the study acknowledges that both creators and the innovators that support them are are increasingly doing business in quicksand and that there is a widespread perception that the copyright system in the US is broken. So the Copyright Office has decided to take a comprehensive approach and during this one year study it looked at every aspect of the music copyright system and looked at the ways that it could be uh, reformed or reviewed. So amongst the most interesting recommendations we find that the Copyright Office believes that at least in the digital realms uh, sound recordings and the underlying musical works should stand on more equal footing. That's uh, definitely an interesting recommendation given all the talks that we are seeing uh, uh, around royalty rates and the disparity between uh, publisher payments and, and, and the label payments. Uh, and the report also talks about uh, including terrestrial radio for, uh, under the section 112 and 114 licenses that govern internet and satellite radio. Another big controversial point here uh, because uh, historically uh, Terrestrial Radio hasn't paid uh, public performance uh, on sound recordings, and the office also recommends the federalization of pre-1972 recordings to overcome all the lawsuits that we're seeing at the moment. And there are a bunch of other recommendations uh, tied to, uh, very important, that are tied to the way the rates are set uh, by the government uh, or by the free market, and how those two things will uh, balance each other out. And interesting, it, interestingly, it calls for the creation of an overarching music rights organization that uh, will, will essentially be able to create a database of all the sound recordings uh, 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 that, that there are uh, that are held by the uh, rights organizations in the U.S. So almost like a, a GRD uh, that is a, a state mandated in a sense. Uh, so, uh, Cristalia, so much to talk about. Let's start with you. Uh, what is the thing that you think is going to be the most controversial out of the recommendations that we're seeing here? I mean, the, the document is so long, we're not going to be able to discuss everything, unfortunately. I guess, but but what sure. do you think is going to be the thing that causes the most ripples if implemented? You know, I, one of the things that jumped out to me, and, and maybe just because it's fairly early on in the report, so I was still fresh <laughs> as I'm slogging through the 245 pages, yeah. um, but one of the things that they call for pretty early up front is that, they, is that we should regulate the musical compositions and the sound recordings in a consistent fashion, um, which is an interesting idea, and people who I think are not as familiar with the music industry often are confused by the fact that we have these two separate copyrights um, in the first place, you know, A, and then B, that we would treat them differently in some fashion. Those of us who've been in, in the know for a while know that, in fact, we, we do maintain these two different copyrights. They're held by different companies. Record labels tend to hold sound recording rights. Music publishers hold compositional rights. Um, and they're treated differently, not least of all for the purposes of, for example, terrestrial performance rights and public performance. So. Uh, it's interesting to say, let's treat them the same. Um, it sounds good, sort of in theory, from this egalitarian perspective, yeah. but most of us know that the reason we treat them differently, right, is because they actually involve different things. Sound recordings have traditionally been paid a higher royalty rate because it costs more to do it, right? There's higher overhead. The record labels have to, or they may, offer an advance to the artists that they sign. Uh, they've got to pay for studio time. They have to, you know, master the recordings and so forth. A lot of times songwriting <laughs> through the music publishers didn't have have the same level of overhead. Yeah. It, this recommendation from the Copyright Office may reflect the fact that they feel that in the new digital age, 
it has become more cost effective for people to do their own sound recordings. Maybe they believe that record labels don't have to pay the same types of advances so that now compositions and sound recordings are, are on somewhat more equal footing and therefore should be treated alike. Um, but good luck. I mean, I, you can imagine that the record <laughs> labels are not going to want to uh, come down to the level of the compositions. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, we, we can try. I, I thought I found that very interesting sort yeah. of right off the bat. It, it seems like, uh, unless I misread it, there also seemed to be a recommendation that uh, uh, there could be some sort of, uh, uh, you know, regulated or, or mandated uh, royalty rates on mechanicals, sorry, as on, on, on master recordings, which is something that uh, we hadn't seen before, I guess, like to try and compensate for the, uh, you know, if they were to raise the, the rates of publishing. So I don't know if that's going to happen. I think that's right. And so, and so I see one point of resistance there being the sort of, are the record labels going to be willing to give in order to pull the, the publishers up a little bit, um, yeah. uh, or vice versa, I guess, as the case may be. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I think that that's pretty interesting. And Dan may have thoughts from the, from the sound recording side, but uh, uh, I, I feel like that might be one challenge just, just to start. Well, I, I, I'm of the opinion, of course, if, if, if this ends up meaning... Uh, more, more money for publishers or record labels, I'm all in favor of it. So that, you know, the, it's, they say a rising tide lifts all boats. So if this means the rates overall going up, it's a good thing. If in fact it means the rates overall going down, it's, you're, you're going to find a lot of pushback. Yeah. Uh, I think there are a few things in this, and I, I have to admit, I have not read all 200 pages. Oh, I haven't pages. either. I'll be very honest. <laughs> no, I haven't managed to. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's pretty dense. Uh, but I, I do think there are a couple important takeaways. And there's a few things that, to me, are, are, are very undeniably good, uh, like the federalization of recordings uh, pre-1972. Uh, you know, my understanding is right now, the streaming digital services, the Spotify's, Pandora's, pay less for, because of sort of ar archaic uh, copyright law, pay less for sound recordings uh, recorded prior to 1972 than they do for contemporary recordings. So, do, so they, that's, do they pay at all? I don't think they pay at all. Right? I don't think they pay. I, don't, right. I, I, think, I think it's a little bit on a case-by-case -case basis, but in, in many cases they don't pay at all. So that's it's an obvious state. oversight. That has to be fixed. Um, and, you know, e even if it, you know, might make... The, the, the digital services grit their teeth a little because they have to pay more. Yeah. It's, it's hard to argue that that's a, a good thing. Uh, I'm also in favor, a, a, as a label, as someone who works with master recordings, uh, that the, the, one of the recommendations is that sound recordings on terrestrial radio, on AM, FM radio, have to be paid. Uh, you know, right now, and this is, again, sort of based on a law that was established many, many years ago when the landscape was different, uh, if a radio station plays a song, they owe a royalty, albeit a, a small one, to the songwriter, to the uh, whoever controls the publishing rights, but nothing to the master uh, record, uh, sound recording holder. So that's another recommendation that I think is is undeniably positive. Yeah, I think where it gets a little more sticky and complicated, and where frankly I haven't even made my mind up yet, is is like you say, turning these will have these MROs. So. What we know of now is the PROs, yeah. the ASCAP and BMI, uh, are suddenly going to take on, they're going to shoulder a whole new burden when, when, when they start dealing with collecting and distributing mechanicals. Uh, and I have some, you know, I, 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 I'm interested to see how that ends up playing out. It's obviously a whole lot of new work and new accounting for them. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Price um, from you know from TuneCore, who's not someone I agree with on everything, but wrote I, I think a fairly convincing uh, article on why he finds that to be problematic. And uh, you know the gist of it is that they're they're already fairly uh, fa fairly uh, the, the royalty calculations and and the royalty distribution is is pretty closed. It's it's right. pretty yeah, opaque. Yeah. And, I, you know, anytime there's a lack of transparency, I'm worried by that. And, you know, when you have these organizations that are, of course, they serve a valuable purpose, but you're concentrating a lot of power in the hands of these organizations that aren't necessarily being completely transparent and accountable in the way that royalties are being paid out. Yeah. Uh, and this is not a small thing. This, you know, when you, when you start taking in uh, mechanicals as well as, uh, the, uh, uh, as well as publishing income, that's a ton of math, a ton of money. <laughs>
this this isn't small potatoes. Absolutely. And uh, Cristela, from your end, like uh, when we're looking at some of the uh, more convoluted uh, uh, parts, uh, which are around, you know, the the, uh, the the braid courts and the reform around that, and the fact that there will be uh, another body that essentially is gonna is gonna mandate those rates, and so that we don't, we won't have to sit through uh, endless trials uh, like like this week in in the, in the BMI and Pandora case. You know, how do you feel about that? Do you think that uh, there is a way to streamline this process in a way in a way that it becomes easier for both parties and less costly as well? Right. Um, you know, I hope so. I think uh, a, a couple of things on that. I think one of the things Dan really nailed here is that it, it, on the one hand, it's interesting to have these MROs with the central level of control who will who will run the royalties across the board. It sounds nice, right? It certainly sounds convenient yeah. for everyone involved. It, 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 you know, consolidates bargaining power and it reduces transaction costs all the things we talk about sort of on the academic side. Um, but as this, uh, as these recent withdrawals have shown us, right, where Sony ATV and Universal Publishing both withdrew from ASCAP and went into the market and got double the rate from Pandora, it shows us that there's also, uh, you know, it gives us some pause as to what, uh, you know, for all of the, the downsides that these collectives have, they also um, have some accountability to someone, right? Yeah. One of the things I thought was really interesting in the, in the report is it talks about and I was, I was very encouraged to see the Copyright Office recognizing this. It keeps calling for transparency, right? It says that our, you know, uh, copyright owners should be able to call for audits, right? Um, it also mentions artists uh, being able to sort of see what's going on in their streaming. Um, and it even, it keeps mentioning these opt-outs, which means we would have these MROs kind of running... Uh, uh, the collective function, uh, but that companies uh, could also opt out of this and engage privately. I like that idea, right? If they can get a better deal, they should be able to go out and get another, a better deal. But as we saw with this uh, this most recent opt out from ASCAP uh, and the rate we got from Pandora, it's not clear if you believe the rate court uh, that that was gotten um, in good faith, right? Yeah. It sounds like there was a lot of coercion, there was a lot of kind of bullying, there were some emails going around. And so we open ourselves up to the risk of kind of big dogs throwing their weight around. And to be fair, I think that, that can go both ways, right? Yeah. The major music publishers can kind of bully Pandora around. Likewise, you know, the Pandoras can bully around record labels and say, hey, do you want piracy or do you want us, right? Take, take yeah. these peanuts. So um, I think the aspirations of the copyright office office here to say let's have a free market and let's 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 get a, a, a market rate going are great but how would we do that when we yeah. have collectives sort of setting the rates i'm encouraged in, insofar as taking that power away from rate courts because i you know i'm of the opinion what business to the courts have setting rates they they're not in the music industry and they don't know what they should be um i don't know that the crb or the mros as they'll become um are the right place to do it um uh, but maybe if we give the the new MRO a sort of a broader authority than we've given the CRB so that instead of just taking whatever rates they're given, they can do their own independent research and sort of figure out what the rates should be. If they can ask, uh, you know, publishers and record labels of all different sizes, if they can ask um, songwriters and recording artists of all different levels, sort of what they think. Uh, if we give them a little more authority to, to do their own research into rate setting, we might be able to get something there. Yeah. And Christelle, just last thing before we close on this, I, I was wondering how do you see this panning out in, in, in legislative terms? Uh, because uh, I, uh, w when this was first put forward, you know, the, the idea of a copyright reform in the US, uh, that was, was back in 2013, I think I was in DC, and, and uh, uh, Maria Palante started talking about that. It was a f sort of the first uh, official uh, remarks around uh, uh, the need for, for this copyright reform. Uh, you know, she seemed to imply, or the Copyright Office seemed to imply, that this would be done uh, sort of step by step, or taking different chunks and essentially trying to reform those, and, and instead of trying to reform the, the entire copyright system, which would be impossible. Uh, you know, in, in this case, we're seeing so many different issues that are being tackled or trying to, you know, that they're trying to tackle, essentially. Uh, but do you see these being able to take the shape of a comprehensive, you know, bill that would cover all this, or would it be, you know, uh, <coughs> measure by measure, or bit by bit, that this would be implemented? Right. Man, it would be really nice if we could get a comprehensive bill. Um, certainly we did in 1976 when we got this, this version of the Copyright Act that we're still working under. So it is, it, it, there had, there's some precedent for it. It's been difficult, right? I mean, you've seen these hearings. You know how hard, hard it is to get people to agree on anything. One thing that I noticed they emphasized throughout this report is we don't want this done piecemeal, right? We want a holistic approach. Don't adopt, you know, 
one and five and eight, but not all the rest of the points because they need to go together. Um, if we can do a good enough job conveying the need for this holistic approach to the congressmen, to the legislators, you know, maybe we, I doubt they're going to get everything they're asking for in here. I doubt yeah. that we could get every, even the three of us in this, on this, on this interview to, to agree on all of these points. But if, if those, the guiding principles that they lay out at the beginning, um, you know, artists should be paid fairly and everyone should be, you know, uh, making money off their work. If people can agree to general principles, I'm hope can. I think the challenge with these legislation in areas like music is always um, comprehension of the legislators, right? They don't get it. They don't know what this is. Um, they're taking a lot of people's words for it. There's a lot of lobbying going on. But if we can get people to agree on a couple of big principles, I'm hopeful that given the, the, the excitement, if you will, and the push in Washington to get something done, I think we will see something. Yeah. I don't think it'll look exactly like this report, but I think we'll see something. And Dan, this uh, ties in uh, perfectly with uh, uh, the uh, digital royalties debate that took center stage at the Grammys uh, uh, you know, uh, on Sunday night uh, as uh, the president of the Recording Academy, uh, Neil Portman, now uh, highlighted the issue uh, together with Jennifer Hudson and Ryan Tedder from One Republic. So essentially it seems like by creating this new uh, Grammy Creators Alliance, which is established to give musicians an amplified voice, uh, uh, the Grammys are already taking a stand around this potential uh, new bill that, that was outlined uh, by the recommendations uh, of, uh, uh, of the Copyright Office. So it's kind of funny to see that uh, in such a short time we've already seen a reaction that was probably planned to some extent, but it, it makes oh, absolutely. Uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, timings wise that this came out now and uh, you know obviously they made the, the usual arguments you know they talked about the disaster scenario of a Grammy award ceremony devoid of new artists and songwriters because they can no longer make a living from their craft and so uh, talked about the fact that uh, new technologies need to pay artists fairly uh, because music matters in people's lives so uh, how do you feel about this kind of initiative uh, I've read a few articles that were pro a few articles that were, that were against it just because you know of the people involved and the fact that they were music millionaires essentially uh, advocating to, to make more money but you know I, I understand the sentiment of it in the sense that they don't just represent themselves they also represent the rest of the musicians so I don't know how, how do you feel about the whole initiative well I'm uh, for starters I'm having to really bite my tongue to not make a quip about the Grammys already being devoid of new artists so <laughs> yeah uh, a, a, a aesthetic and musical judgments aside uh, you know I'm, I'm not necessarily the, the the biggest fan of every single artist who's in you know in in this commission, but I, I think what they're doing is extremely important. And and the fact of the matter is, you know there there are there's already quite a few stakeholders uh, in this conversation over over copyright. Uh, and you know you better believe that ASCAP and BMI and Pandora and Spotify and and and, and all of these folks are, are following it carefully. Have legal teams have you know highly paid experts ready to to advance their case and. Uh, you know, uh, the, the obvious question, of course, is who, whose voice is missing in all of this? And it, it is the musicians and the content creators. Uh, you know, the fact that this alliance that was announced is all musicians who are already doing fine for themselves. Yeah. I, I, I think is arguably besides the point. I mean, this is, it's, it's to create visibility for the issue. These people, for better or worse, ha have more influence yeah. than your, than your average starving musician down the block. Uh, of course, we have to see how they behave and what recommendations they end up, you know, it, it, it all comes down to, to what they do from here. At, at this point, all they've really done is announce an alliance. They haven't, they haven't done much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, what, one, one, one would hope that they, they're going to advocate on behalf not only of the uh, artists who've already made it, but of the artists and songwriters who are struggling, re really on every level of the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's... A, 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 an utterly critical voice in this debate because it's these are the people w w without whom we wouldn't be having this conversation in the first place because there wouldn't be music. Yeah. Uh, so to see the Grammys get involved in in advocacy is is something I'm in favor of. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting, actually, you know, we're seeing, uh, I don't know, Cristali, if you have any thoughts on, on whether the music industry might be able to put together a, 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 a coherent front. You know, we, we've seen, a, for example, uh, Jennifer Hudson said, no, who is it? No, it was a Ryan Tedder actually remarked on the fact that, you know, from the Turtles to Taylor Swift, uh, long time uh, established and new generation artists are speaking out. Uh, this is 
great, but at the same time we're seeing artists speak out in all sorts of different ways and also all sorts of different issues and have very different opinions around those. You know, we're seeing somebody like uh, Ed Sheeran and, and you know Avicii speaking uh, in favor of Spotify, somebody like Taylor Swift uh, being completely against Spotify, uh, both influential, uh, you know, they're all influential artists. Uh, at the same time, we have the Turtles that were fighting the pre-1972 uh, lawsuit and so they were involved in a different front. And so on, on that side, do you think that there is a chance the industry can put forward a, a united front when it comes to uh, going going to uh, you know lobby a congress around, around these issues yeah so that's a really good inquiry i think i think the, the answer is yes as to some things but i think um andrea that you bring up a really good point that i always emphasize when when people kind of ask like uh or, or people will say sort of uh, off the cuff like um well what do artists want right and i and i always find that an interesting question because that's like saying well what do people want right because artists yeah. are people like yeah. anyone else right um what do people want for lunch today well it depends on who you ask right and i i say that's the the perfect analogy for saying what do artists want it depends on who you ask and frankly it even it's not just on the individual artist who have their own political views and personal views and you know financial situations uh, creative motivations but also when you ask them right yeah. when they're when they're on their sophomore album when they're trying to get a deal when they're learning how to play the piano you know they're 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 the, that that they're um temporal sort of timing of when you ask them is different and i think it's really important i'm always wary of these artists alliance right it's not specific to music the the publishing industry is having the same problem with uh, you know some writers saying oh you know we want our stuff everywhere just you know writing for 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 fun and we want everyone to read our stuff and other yeah. people saying well we want people to read our stuff but preferably after they've paid for it and you know we don't have our, uh, uh, authors uh, all on the same page <laughs> pun intended um so <laughs> it's not su so surprising that's all i got it's not so surprising that we wouldn't have you know musicians all all um in agreement either and i think that's okay yeah. i don't think that all artists have to want exactly no, the exactly, same yeah. things in, in order to present a united front for the purposes of revisions to the copyright act right because regardless of where the the art the musician is in their in their career whether they're a superstar or or a baby band um to say do you want some transparency into you where your streaming royalties are going i think the answer is yes of course i would love to know you know what that looks like um so I think there are these, like again, these big overarching points which we can agree on. And then, yeah, you know, maybe someone like Taylor Swift cares a lot more about terrestrial performance rights because she's being played on the radio a lot, you yeah. know. Maybe someone like Avicii, somewhat less so, who's like, I'm willing to give up my terrestrial performance rights. No one's playing me on terrestrial radio anyway. I'll take higher digital royalties. You know, and yeah. now we're starting to get into the nuances in which artists can disagree. But to ask, but do both of you want to know what you're being paid? <laughs> I think the answer there is yes, that would be Absolutely. fantastic. Yeah. 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 And just, just to add a small point to that, I think, you know, for, for better or worse, it, it is the artists who really create public visibility and dialogue around these issues and, and take it out of the realm of, inside baseball, where it's only people who sort of have a direct financial stake in what's going on, uh, to, to having people talking about it at, at, you know, at, at work and, and at home. I, I, I think it's, uh, they're the people who are driving this conversation. And, and, uh, and for that reason alone, I think it's important that they have a voice and that they have a seat at the table. Absolutely. They don't have to agree yeah. on everything. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, but if I can add one small point, the other sure, the other course. point of value I find in this too is whether or not everyone in the artist alliance is in you know a total agreement at all at all stages. I think what it does do is it, you know to build on Dan's point for public awareness and perception, it helps to solidify the fact that or to make it you know clear for the first time for some people that artists and uh, copyright owners are not always the same people. And I think, um, you know, one of the big problems I know some, some of the, the major record labels have had is saying, oh, well, you know, they get this pushback from consumers saying, oh, the big record labels, they have all this money, you know, we don't care about stealing money, stealing from them, right? Uh, this is a, a PR problem that they have. And I think it's important sometimes for the public to see, okay, but that's, you know, first, probably not true, uh, but second, uh, that is that is a separate corporation from the actual artists who are making the music. And sometimes having the artists in their own alliance helps to make that uh, that that distinction clear for the public. Like yes, most absolutely. public, if you you know all the all the surveys say, would you steal from your favorite artist? They would say absolutely not. But would you steal from 
you know, Sony, yeah, maybe, right? And so <laughs> you want to show that, like, although oftentimes the, the, the interests are aligned between Sony and the artists, not always, right? There's also just a real person behind that who's making music and doing the best they can. Absolutely. And as a complete aside, uh, it was a really somber ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it seemed like uh, most of the t songs were sort of s down tempo and there were a lot of ballads and uh, I, I don't know, it just felt b quite dark uh, in general. <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if uh, anybody had the same impression, but uh, and I also watched the really terrible uh, UK cut of, of, of the of the whole thing that uh, left out uh, uh, to my great uh, chagrin uh, Miranda Lambert's performance. I was like, why? Why did I cut it out? Come on. <laughs> She's I hope great. they included Kanye and Beck. Oh, they didn't include <laughs> Kanye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, my, my entire Facebook feed still. It's a couple days later and this is all any of my friends seem to be talking about. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's kind of a weird one because it's such a personal view on it, it just really depends on whether you're a fan of Kanye or not, right? <laughs> what you think about that story. <laughs> so it's kind of because if you're not a fan of Kanye, you know, it, there's only one thing you can think about him. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you are a fan of him, he makes it difficult, I think. Yeah, T tough guy to love. Tough yeah. guy to love. It's hard to love. <laughs> Definitely. Like, yeah. I especially like the one that the, the people that tallied up was it 85 people that worked on Beyonce's record and they were like why is that real artistry and and you know and back it done most most of the album himself it, that is not real artistry what, what is he talking about <laughs> you know i actually not not to go on a tangent but i i i actually have to make a comment on that i've i've seen that argument a lot and i, I, I to me it doesn't hold a lot of water right uh it's it to me it has to do with variances in styles i mean the you know beyonce's record was a pop record and pop records have huge production teams it, the end product is every bit as much art as Beck's album was, and they're both art. It's not. It's. I think it's silly to say one is more or less artistic than yeah, the other. Yeah, uh, but it, it does. It does make it more of a ironic. I think. I mean, I, I totally agree with you that they're both, you know, art uh, in, in in full effect. It's just ironic that the comment was made on a record that is so overproduced. And <laughs> but you know, well, <laughs> and and, uh, fair and moving on to talking about Deezer, actually, let's talk about streaming services a little bit. Uh, uh, Deezer will be the first streaming service to launch a high-quality, uh, uh, you know, uh, product uh, on a large scale in 150 countries uh, uh, over the next few weeks uh, after launching uh, the Deezer Elite product in the United States uh, in the second half of 2014. So, uh, current uh, Deezer Premium Plus subscribers will be able to experience the Elite service uh, on Sonos uh, systems only. So, a very restricted uh, launch uh, to Sonos users only, and will be able to s stream FLAC files for free as long as they own a Sonos system and are prepared to pay for a year's subscription in advance so it's quite it's quite an ask for subscribers to uh, pay for 120 bucks essentially in advance in order to access uh, uh, the service uh, uh, European users who do not currently subscribe to these uh, will be able to jump on board by paying a year in advance plus an additional 36 euros as far as I understand so that will bring the total to 156 euros roughly for the subscription for a year but you'd have to fork out in advance which is definitely uh, gonna be a problem uh, the price point is significant though because uh, we've seen a product like Tidal come out uh, which costs uh, you know nineteen dollars ninety nine or nineteen pounds ninety nine a month, which is high quality, same same kind of quality that Deezer is offering. And uh, um, here the price point is a lot lower. So my question is, do you think that if high quality is only thirty percent more expensive, would they would it get more users to to come through uh, than if it is uh, twice as much as as the uh, normal service? My honest response is no. <laughs> I don't think for most listeners it's going right. to make a difference. Uh, and I say that only because I think first the audience for those who who care and can tell the difference between the, the various qualities is, is a significantly small oh. subset of the overall user base. And even within the overall user base, we've been having trouble getting people to pay even the, the, the $9.99 or $4.99 or whatever it is per month uh, sort of services. People are uh, migrating uh, towards the, the freemium services and staying there. Um, the, the good news, I guess, for people who are working in this premium music space is that those who are willing to pay the nine ninety nine a month are more likely to also uh, fall into the group of people who care about audio quality. Um, 
and so maybe willing to put the money forward. Uh, yeah. You know, it, with the Sonos deal, I think you know, if you can afford a Sonos, you may actually care about music yeah. and you may actually have the money to pay for a year up front of Deezer. So it's the right audience. Like in that sense, it makes sense. These are not, you know, uh, uh, this is not, you know, sort of people who can't do it or who don't care about music. They cared enough to get the system. They're tech savvy enough to know how to play, stream music through it. And arguably they have the incomes to do it. So it's the right audience, but I don't know how niche of an audience that is for Deezer. Yeah. Um, it's it, they're not going to they're not going to steal people away from from Spotify. And you know, m- sort of my evidence for that is Ask Beats Music. How well it went when they said we're not giving yeah. you uh, chances for free, and it's just nine ninety nine, and that's it. Like, ask them how that went for them, right? Yeah. In the long run, like, where how's their user base? Yeah, yeah, Dan. I I completely agree. I think uh, you know Deezer is entering. They're already entering a, a, an extremely crowded market. I think most of the people who are going to stream music already have their their service of choice, and it, you know, as we've seen, uh, you know, even with with Pandora's uh, listener acquisition sort of uh, uh, flattening out, yeah. most people seem to have found their service and, and settled on it. Uh, you know, I think I think their affiliate Sonos is a, a really smart move. I mean, it's sort of a, a Trojan horse they can use to ride in and enter this extremely crowded market. But for this. Uh, this niche that they're going for of you know hot, really really high quality audio. I mean, I, you know, I haven't seen the numbers on how Title Wimp Title has been doing. And yeah, it's got uh, seventeen thousand uh, subscribers, I believe. So at the moment, that's you know, I it, the the audio quality on that is great, and I, I I know they've they've had some some moves themselves lately, but seventeen thousand to me is not a particularly impressive number. Yeah. So, and I I think it shows that there's a there's a finite audience uh, for this style. That is wants that level of, of um, audio uh, fidelity and is prepared to pay for it. Yeah, uh, I you know I, I do wonder anytime I see a, a streaming service really trying to make inroads in the states whether to, to a certain degree if that ship has just sailed. Uh, yeah. It's just it's just such a crowded market at this point. Yeah, Cristal, you made a really good point talking about the fact that uh, uh, it's difficult to find a way to steal users away from other streaming services if they are already with other streaming services. And a story that came up this week that turned out to be, at least it was denied, we don't know if you had any truth to it at all, so we'll just uh, comment on it as a, an entirely speculative story, is the fact that uh, Apple uh, was reportedly looking into the potential of buying uh, uh, the label Big Machine, so the label that uh, represents uh, Taylor Swift as well as Rascal Flatts and Florida Georgia Line. Uh, Although, obviously, Taylor Swift would be the big draw for that. Uh, and the reported acquisition price, uh, as reported by Hits Daily Double, was $150 million, uh, uh, which would make sense uh, given uh, the, the ballpark that uh, uh, Scott Borchetta was reportedly trying to sell the label at a few months ago. Uh, so, interesting here to look at the potential of uh, iTunes becoming a label. Uh, because a few months ago we would have you know, dismissed it entirely and I, I have as well on the show. On the other hand, I think Apple might be looking at what's happening with uh, uh, the Netflixes and the Amazons of this world in, in Hollywood uh, and, and how, uh, how big inroads they're making essentially in Hollywood and, and how influential they become in just a couple of years. And it might be thinking whether there is any chance that they can recreate that in music and create an exclusive, exclusive environment where they can deliver some uh, material... Uh, exclusively to their audience and, and therefore uh, uh, gather an audience uh, by, by proxy. So uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, iTunes actually denied the story, so it might not be true at all. There might be some truth to it. We don't really know. But just as an idea, uh, do you think that uh, it might make more sense now, given the, that we've seen how the Netflix model works? Or is music still too different for, for this to work properly? Uh, Cristalia? Um you know, I like I like when people experiment and are willing to try new things. Certainly, Netflix uh, kind of found this um, you know serendipitous success in the ability to be both a producer of content and distributor of content, and how sort of get the vertical integration from that. Um, you know, I guess I, I, I don't want to say it couldn't work. I think that music has challenges, right? And music is a different beast than 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 anything else. And I think this actually plays into your question about how difficult it is to move consumers once they've settled into their service, as Dan was saying. If people have largely found their service now, um, for example, you know, I I'm Spotify, right? So I have 
hundreds and hundreds of playlists and friends and whatever on Spotify. I'm also an Amazon Prime user, so technically I don't need Spotify. I could stream on Amazon Music for free, literally for free, and I still pay for Spotify because yeah. the daunting task of transferring my playlists over is just not exactly. something I could possibly do. The difference between, say, an HBO, a Showtime, and the music industry, right, is all of the services have the same stuff, right? So it's not like... Amazon has something that Spotify doesn't have. They have the same music, right? Now, if what Apple's going to do is try and, you know, produce and create its own music and the only place you could get, you know, I don't know, Beyonce's new album is iTunes, I would say, well, that smells a lot like what we've already seen, which is sort of these exclusive releases where you get that for two weeks and then everyone else gets it. But unlike, again, unlike television or film, that doesn't really work, we know, in music, right? As soon as it gets released on one exclusive outlet, you know, a third of a second later, it's everywhere else on the internet. So, uh, you know, given bandwidths and given um, sort of the pervasiveness of music being something you don't need to be sitting down in front of your computer to do or in front of your television to do, you could be running or cleaning yeah. or driving. Um, it's it's a different beast. And, you know, maybe someone like an Apple will figure out a way to make, uh, make music a destination where, like, you must go to this place to get it. Like, people must go to HBO to get Game of Thrones. Um, but I don't see it yet. And if, if all they have in mind is album exclusives, I, you know, I would be worried about that model. It's, it's, it's sort of an old idea dressed up in, in new packaging. Yeah. It uh, sounds like, right? <laughs> it really, you know, it, it's not that different from saying, you know, uh, this service will get an album a week before every other service. It's not that different from saying, you know, that the new Jay-Z album is going to be bundled in on, on Samsung phones. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I imagine that when this whole Taylor Swift uh, Spotify kerfluffle happened uh, a couple months ago, that immediately got the, the gears turning at Apple saying, you know, how can we take this artist and, and just literally pry her away from the other services and bring her on. So I, I, I see what the thinking is. But like Cristelia says, if, you know, if, if it were only, if her music were only exclusively available on Apple, I, I think the result is you just see a whole bunch of piracy. Yeah. You might get some new people moving over to Apple, but I don't think, you know, th these services are designed to be sticky. Like, you know, Spotify, RDO with the playlists and your friends and the social aspect, you know, the, the, it, because they're all offering the same service, they have to give you these other incentives to stay with them. Yeah. And I just don't, no matter how big of a Taylor Swift fan you are, no, no, no matter how big of a fan of Artist X you are, I don't see throwing your old service in the garbage can and moving <laughs> over to Apple just because they have the new Taylor Swift album. It, 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 it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. No, absolutely. I agree. And, and to add to that, I think if we sat here together and thought about, you know, we were saying Taylor Swift, I said Beyonce, we could name on one hand the artists that may or may not even be possible candidates for something like this. Sure. Um, right. And that's another really big difference between, I think, music and television, right? When HBO came out with Game of Thrones, no one had heard of the author. No one had heard of these books except for a, a very small handful of nerds, right? No one had any idea what this was going to be. And people are willing I'm to one watch of those nerds. get into it. <laughs> but, well, me too. I, I've read the books. It's fun. But what I'm saying is, so, but people are more willing to, to give HBO the brand the benefit and check this new thing out and then, you know, get into it through social media and so forth. With music, it's kind of the, the opposite. Like, you already have to be really into that artist and then you might, you might, but maybe not, go follow them somewhere else, right? Like, yeah. if you're already way into Taylor Swift, you might listen to what Apple has to say. But certainly not, you know, the art, the musician equivalent of Game of Thrones is not going to get anyone to do anything. And also because uh, fans feel some sort of ownership towards their, the artists, to a certain degree anyway. Just the fact that some, uh, some, something might be completely cut off from, from the rest of the world just by one company because they want to put it in their own service might actually act, act against them to some, to some extent. I don't know. It's just a thought. It might. Might I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I guess if there's a, a Taylor Swift fans out there that uh, were really anti Apple and uh, and she ended up going with them, then that would be a problem. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, I wanted to cover uh, after talking about uh, the potential Apple service and uh, uh, Deezer. Uh, Rhapsody has also, has also released a few figures uh, just a, few, uh, a couple of hours ago, and uh, they reported that f they've uh, reached the milestone of two and a half million subscribers, which uh, is you know it's uh, it's quite so surprising. You know, Rhapsody is never is not mentioned as often as the other services really, but as far as I can tell, it is the 
uh, third biggest service in the world at, at this point uh, uh, if uh, we're looking at uh, you know Spotify number one and Deezer and number two I would imagine it's a toss up between uh, Rhapsody and, 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 and Audio uh, although I don't really know what the numbers for Audio are at the moment uh, and uh, you know they, they've seen a lot of growth 60% growth in the last year they've had a great success with their Telefonica deal that allowed them to launch in South America and become pretty pervasive in a short time over there uh, and it seems that they're doing things pretty well one of the things that's interesting to me is, is on the branding side uh, obviously it's called Rhapsody in uh, the US it's still called it's called Napster in most of the rest of the world uh, so do you think that this might be one thing that they need to sort out uh, in terms of, you know, becoming a sort of a global powerhouse for streaming music in the same way that Spotify or, or Deezer are? They have the one name and, you know, they, they're known for that name uh, around the world. Thoughts? <laughs> Dan? That's a great question. I... <laughs> I, I hate to take a pass on this. I don't have a whole lot of thoughts on Rhapsody. It's, it's you know, I, I, and, I, and perhaps that is uh, indicative of, of their their sort of uh, failure in branding. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, um, I mean, that, that's interesting, right? Because you're in the States, so you should, you know, it's, it's a company that is, is, is fairly well-known in the States still, I would imagine. Certainly. Well, and, and obviously those numbers are good. And I mean, it leads me to believe that they are doing better than RDO and, and, and services like that. But uh, but who knows, really, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, being... right. I, I think the 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 more interesting to statistic for me, and I've not I haven't seen this for any of the services, but this is what I'd like to see is not number of subscribers, um, which can be padded in such a variety of ways, right? I think for some time Rhapsody came pre-installed on on PCs, and you know can be part of someone's mobile package. I I would be much more interested in you know active users, and, right. you know, however that's defined, like number of listening minutes per per month. Yeah. Uh, you know, number of times of logging in or sharing of songs or sort of, you know, that kind of thing. Because those are the users who are ultimately, like, when their three-month trial that came with their PC or whatever runs out are, are going to, yeah. to sort of be engaged. Um, in terms of, you know, c consistent naming and branding, you know, I think that the reason, you know, the Napster name didn't stick around here as well, although Best Buy tried for a while, uh, it had that sort of negative connotation maybe, um, yeah. you know, from, from the peer-to-peer -peer sort of its, its its early rude days or positive association depending on which side of, of that you were on. Um, and uh, maybe it didn't have that in the rest of the world. I don't know that it has to have the same name in the States as elsewhere necessarily to, yeah. to, to succeed. Um, but I think Dan's spot on that, you know, Rhapsody doesn't sound like the sexy streaming service that all the cool kids are right. on, right? It's certainly exactly. like the one that came with your mom's PC. Um, and so if, you know, if you're going to, uh, to start getting into streaming, that may or may not be the name that, that you're, you're sort of sold. Yeah. Uh, and it's weird, like, I, it feels like they should just forget both names because both names sort of remind yeah. you of things of the past and just find a new name for the whole thing. Maybe I, I, yeah. I think they could certainly stand to benefit from a, from a rebranding. Uh, yeah. In fairness to them, though, I do think that this most recent announcement uh, included some statistics about actual listening time. Because, like you say, subscriber numbers is, or you know, the number of people who have Rhapsody installed on their computers is, is, in some ways, a bit of a meaningless statistic. Yeah. But I think they said their users listen to something in the area of five million uh, hours of music a week, and that's that's an impressive statistic. Right. That's not nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's not nothing. And uh, obviously, Pandora is the service that always wins when it comes to listening hours because uh, yeah, yeah. Pandora users just uh, keep it on the whole day. Uh, although Pandora did have some uh, troubles uh, last week when they reported their Q4 earnings uh, and missed uh, uh, the revenue expectations and revenue guidance for for the next quarter. Uh, so the, the, the company's share actually went down quite a bit uh, uh, from that announcement. Uh, the only good thing for Pandora is that uh, although listeners only grew 7%, uh, over 2014, uh, they, the listening hours went up quite a bit. So even though they, they don't seem to be able to find that many new users to join the service anymore, uh, they are listening to more of Pandora than ever. So that's a good thing for the company. It also feels a little bit like uh, they're starting to such, you know, become saturated in the market. So uh, interesting to see whether they're going to attempt to spend some money and uh, uh, expand internationally, even, even with the challenges uh, created by the rates. I don't know what's going to happen there. Do you think that, you know, we talked about the design of, of, of Pandora last week and the fact that it felt like uh, the company needed a bit of a refresh. But as, as far as uh, expansion is concerned, uh, did, did, would you like to see, uh, you know, do you think that uh, Pandora uh, could succeed uh, abroad? And, uh, uh, and what are your thoughts on that, Cristalia? 
Um, absolutely. I think the thing that Pandora really has going for it, uh, with all of its need for a refresh, perhaps, and 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 you know a little bit of you know renewed marketing and so forth, is its complete and utter. Um, you know, ease, right? Yeah. Like there's nothing to do except name a genre you like or name two or three artists or name one song that you want to hear songs like it, right? And as much as, you know, the folks who come on this show are like, you know, really into music and, you know, would, would have a lot of fun putting together a playlist for the average person, the average consumer of music, that, that'd be torturous. They don't know what to put on it. They don't have the time to do it. They have no interest in putting this together. Uh, but they do have that one Taylor Swift song they like. So play me stuff that sounds like this, right? Right. Yeah. And 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 it's going on in the background and I just don't have to mess with it anymore. Right. It's not a playlist that's gonna run out and need to be shuffled or refreshed. I don't have to follow a friend and listen to what they're listening to, right? I just get everything hand fed to me and I, I, I would think that that's uh, laziness is a um, a selling point that cuts across all cultures and I, 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 I don't think they should have any problem doing well in, in any market in which people like to uh, benefit with very little effort, that's your service. Yeah. And it's interesting I, to say that. Sorry, go ahead. I, I, I would agree, but with one caveat. I mean, I, I think Pandora is going to have to expand to other countries. Uh, and I, I can guarantee you this is a conversation that they're having internally. I mean, they, they have to be. Um, because if the, you know, if the user base is, is sort of it, it reaching a, a saturation point in the States, and it's great that the hours are going up, uh, and, and there's no surprise why that is. It's exactly what Cristalia said. Uh, it's, you know, people turning it on at the start of the day or they're working at a cafe and they put it on in the background. That's fantastic. But still user acquisition is slowing down. They're not, you know, the, 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 the rate of earnings is going down. I think the investors are, are, are getting a little spooked. And my understanding of Pandora is in the States and like one or two, like Australia. And that's it, I think. And that's it, really. It's, it's, it's not in Europe, to my knowledge. It's no. not in South America. And, and, and I think there are, there are logistical and uh, financial difficulties with expanding into those markets. Yeah. Even beyond just the branding and introducing people, there's uh, you know di di different licensing rates and so on. And I mean, a whole, you know, Pandora's already sort of fighting legal battles on a couple fronts. Yeah. Uh, and so I can understand why, in one sense, they might not have the appetite to open up a whole new front in Europe to try to expand <laughs> there. But you know, if you're at if you're at this point in the states where you're really not going to get a whole lot of new users. And your investors are saying we need the business to grow. Then you have to, you know, I mean, it's 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 like what the cigarette companies did when cigarette sales started going down in, in the <laughs> states. You know, there's it's 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 a big wide world out there. There's there's a lot of potential customers, and I think that Pandora, you know, if they want to continue growing, uh, I, I think it's a necessity for them that they begin exploring. Uh, other territories and the problem is that they're not a non-brand abroad because you know they've i think they've been live in the uk for, for a few months or maybe a couple of i can't remember how long they were live for some time in the uk before they pulled out uh because of the rates but uh it, essentially it's a non-brand so they have to start from scratch and and spend a lot of money in marketing i guess for to get some traction in these territories because here in the uk for example people have already sort of made a lot of choices when it comes to their digital music listening so uh, if a new service comes around it really has to give them a reason to uh, as, as we talked about for everything else to switch uh, sure. so we'll have to see how that how that pans out and finally i wanted to uh, briefly touch on the uh, billboard power 100 which has been published uh, this week uh, uh, on billboard uh, <coughs> and uh, lucian grange surprise surprise is uh, the number one uh, in the billboard power 100 which makes a lot of sense uh, uh, unseating jay-z and beyonce who are the number one last year uh, interestingly jay-z and beyonce have disappeared from the chart entirely uh, <laughs> from one to zero uh, or uh, they might have decided that they didn't want to have artists on the chart uh, i guess uh, that also made sense uh, um, daniel x uh, from a digital perspective i guess uh, daniel x spotify ceo uh, climbs from number 25 to 20 uh, jimmy yovine uh, beats co the beats, beats co-founder uh, uh, climbs from t uh, number 10 to number five which is interesting considering that uh, you know uh, 
Spotify is actually has a lot more users than Beats Music, but uh, I guess the Apple acquisition helped uh, on that. And uh, um, obviously, Rio Caro, uh, Vivo CEO, up until the end of 2014, has uh, disappeared from the list. Uh, and Tim Westergren, uh, Pandora's founder, is now sharing the spot with the company's CEO and is uh, at number 40, climbing from 55. So a lot of moves here. I mean, the, 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 definitely there is a pattern here that everybody's still very white and very male, which I, I can't oh, say. Yeah. I can't say anything because I, I'm both as well. But uh, you know, it's, it, it it is pretty striking when you look at the top 100 that it's uh, the, the you know there's still a lot of work to do on the on that front. Uh, any anything else on, on the list, or you know, do you think there should be more artists on here that are powerful uh, writers, or, or you know, h- how do you feel this should should play out? Well, Billboard just doesn't respect artistry, as as Kanye would say. Uh, I, I do think it's surprising <laughs> to see uh, Beyonce and Jay Z's complete omission from the list. And yeah. it does feel very white and very male. Uh, you know, Billboard, it is probably worth a- a- at least making note of the fact that late last year, uh, in December, Billboard did uh, a piece on women in music. Yeah. And, and they did their own sort of uh, power list of, of women with, I think it was uh, Michelle Anthony was number one and uh, Jody Gerson uh, from Universal Publishing was, was there. Um well, well and good. It, it does also sort of ghettoize them a little bit, and you know th- they, you know, those two appear in this power list, but much, much further down the charts. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, a lot of women actually are sharing their spot with with a man. So there's yeah. very, very few women that are on the list by themselves, uh, which is interesting. Cristalia, from from your perspective, how, how how do you feel about this list, and and do you think that it, you know, is is it just reflective of the music industry that today? Could it be different? Um. I do think it's reflective of the music industry today. Uh, as someone who's worked in the music industry, I'd say that that's what it looks like, um, for, for, for better or for worse. I, I, I agree with Dan that once you have a, a you know, most powerful list and then a most powerful women's list, you already know that you're, you're losing that particular fight because you have the two separate lists, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and so while it's nice to, that someone's doing, you know, getting some recognition, it would, be, it would be great if they got some recognition in the list itself. But uh, that doesn't make the list inaccurate, right? It, it, it may just be inaccurate reflection uh, of what the industry looks like now. Um, although, uh, as things are, are moving towards more and more of the digital side of things, um, and, you know, women are taking, uh, uh, and minorities of various stripes are taking a, an active role in sort of shaping consumer preferences and what new product offerings look like, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll begin to see uh, lots of different uh types of folks and different voices um, shaping what, what that's going to look like. Yeah, let's hope it looks different in 10 years' time. And uh, uh, that's pretty much all we have time for today. But uh, I want to uh, stop for a second and uh, ask you uh, about what's going on uh, uh, you know, with you. And so, Cristalia, uh, on your end, anything that you want to talk about that you'd like to plug or that you're working on? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, so, uh, as you, as Andrea mentioned, I'm uh, teaching at the University of Colorado Law School now. Coming up on March 5th, we're going to have a big content conference, which is the first of its sort for the law school and for our uh, Silicon Flatiron Center for Law and Technology here. Uh, we're going to have two panels, uh, intentionally uh, very different panels. The first will be all artists. So we'll have a graffiti artist named uh, A-Hole, who's Miami-based. He's going to talk about his lawsuit, his recent settlement uh, on his lawsuit against American Eagle for using his art. We've got Bonnie Schiffman, the photographer, who took the picture of the back of Rod Stewart's head, and, and he used it on album cover. So we're going to talk about that lawsuit. We've got Aloe Black recording artist and songwriter, um, and uh, Mimi Wesson, who's an author and also a professor at the law school. So a great panel of artists talking in their own terms about how technology has affected their creative processes um, and, and, and what copyright means to them in that in that sort of context. Uh, we'll then follow with a panel that will have uh, folks who are from the industry side and distribution. So we'll have someone from Lionsgate, someone from NBC Universal, um, someone from Getty Images, um, Netflix, et cetera, who will be Spotify, uh, you know, general counsel will come out and talk about the challenges for technology and the distribution space and content. And we're hoping to get a conversation where the two sides can speak to each other. Uh, in addition, I'm going to do a fireside chat with Maria Palante, the U.S. Register of Copyrights, oh, great. Um, talking about this report and the, the other two or three that should be out by the time we get to March 5th. Um, so it's a free conference. It's in beautiful uh, Boulder, Colorado. And uh, I encourage anyone who might be interested, go to uh, siliconflatirons.com and uh, sign up and come out and see us. That's, be a lot of 
That's fantastic. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll pop the link in the show notes as well. And uh, uh, I would uh, love to be there, but unfortunately, it's not to be. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Dan, uh, on your end, uh, uh, anything? Uh, what, what's going on? And what were uh, any interesting artists that you'd like to to plug as well? Well, you know, that's that's way cooler than anything I've been doing. So that's a that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I've been keeping plenty busy with. Uh, you know, I, I run a, a sync licensing agency called Friendly Fire Licensing. That's been keeping me awfully busy, uh, and I'm working as well with a uh, fine label out of uh, New York called Sky Council Recordings. So if I'm going to give a an artist shout out. There's a, a great record coming out in a couple weeks from a Canadian band called Artisan Loyalist. It's uh, members of Fonts, which is the one of the first bands I ever started working with about ten or eleven years ago. Uh, and then a lot of cool stuff coming up. Uh, my publishing company, uh, Cooking Vinyl America, we have a, a whole slew of good releases on the way uh, this coming year. So obviously, if anyone's interested in chatting with me about any of those, they're welcome to hit me up on, on Twitter or elsewhere. Great. But I'm, I'm, I'm not putting on any conferences. <laughs> just, just attending. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, Cristalia, sorry, uh, is there going to be any recordings of this, uh, just in case uh, anybody's interested? It will. It'll be archived and it will also be live streamed. So uh, after the show, if you remind me, I'll shoot you a link that you can include that people can access it there. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Well, thanks so much uh, for your time, uh, both. And uh, uh, thanks so much for listening to the show this week. Uh, it's been a, a really fun show and uh, lots of copyright talk, but hopefully we made it interesting. And thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until next time.